microbes. There are many of them. And let me put it this way. There's probably not a single place on Earth. On Earth. Not in the human bodies, there are places that do not have microbes. But on Earth, practically everywhere you're going to find them. I can't really think of it. Well, okay. Volcanic craters. Just too freaking hot. Other than that, everywhere there are microbes. And we call them this. We call them microbes because they, because they are really small, okay? The smallest viruses, such as polio or uh, hepatitis D, they can be in size of 30, 40 nanometers in diameter. To give you a perspective how small it is, it's a thousand times smaller than the diameter of the human hair. Obviously, you cannot see that type of the microbe with a naked eye anyway. Most of the microbes, in fact, cannot be seen with a naked eye. You can see them only in the microscope. Either light microscope, like viruses, in that ballpark. Or, sorry, electron microscope, like viruses, or light microscope, like bacteria and protozoa and fungi and, and so on. However, if you think, are there any microbes that you can see with your naked eye? The answer is yes. There's a gigantic bacteria called Thiomargarita namibiensis, which lives in the water, on the, on the shores. And it approximately, the, its diameter is comparable to the thickness of the paper clip. So you know the, the wire that paper clip is made of? That's how big the one cell is. So it's huge, it's gigantic. But we're not going to look at this guy. We're not going to look at Thio Margarita. Most of the work that we're going to do in the class, the lab work, um, is gonna, it's going to be about bacterial cells. So we will have to use microscope a lot. And we're going to have a separate lab on the use of microscope. And one of the goals of this class is to make you absolutely comfortable with microscopy. Okay. So again, going back to the microbes, viruses I mostly lie in the range of electron microscope, while the bacteria lie in the range of the light microscope. And those microbes that we're going to work with, those bacteria that we're going to work with, are pretty regular. They're not outstanding. Some of them can be pathogenic and you will be able to see those bacterial cells using microscopes there in the, in the cabin. Now microbiology, the field of microbiology studies all kinds of organisms, viruses, bacteria, fungi. Interestingly enough, there's another group of um, pathogenic organisms called helminths that are also included generally in the scope of study for microbiology. The main reason for that, if you think about it, helminths, or we, we call them worms often, okay, not the earthworms, no, they're not pathogenic, but like intestinal worms. These worms can cause disease, and we're going to focus um, mostly, if not exclusively, on the clinically relevant microbes. I will mention some microbial species that help us, you know, in our day-to-day -day life, but we mostly look at the bugs that cause disease. And helminths, they can cause disease. However, they, you have to understand, helminths are not microscopic. They're pretty large. Um, some of them can reach the land of about 12, 15 feet. Some of them can be longer than that, certain species. So we're gonna, hopefully we're going to talk about them as well. All right, any questions? So far, good. So what are those microbes? You, you will find in many places through the lectures that some, some stuff is missing. Okay? I want to encourage you to make notes, okay? So we're going to make notes together, right? 
So let's let's talk about major types classes. It's not classes. It's pretty much phyla of microbial um, microorganisms. First, of course, that comes to mind is is bacteria. Bacteria are unicellular organisms, right? They they bacteria always consist of one cell. They cannot establish multicellular forms. And we're going to talk about them, why they cannot do that. And you can see illustrations of different bacterial cells. On the right, you can see that they can assume different forms and shapes, but they always are single-celled. You can say, wait a minute, but what about, what about this, this uh, microscopy uh, specimen of, of Vibrio that you can see like a ton of microbes, they're all sticking to each other. Well, it's like a crowd. It's not actually a family, you know, it's not a multicellular organism. It's a lot of different, independent, individual, unicellular organisms. You take one bacterial cell, it can survive. You take one human cell, it's going to die. Does that make sense? You see the difference between unicellular and organism is independent, one cell is independent, and multicellular, when cells depend on each other. Okay? Archaea, again, it's a single cell. Okay? Both of them, by the way, don't have nucleus. They are, how do we call organisms without nucleus? Pro, you don't have to raise your hand, just say, huh? Well, we can call them anucleated. There's a fancy word for it. Pro, there's pro and there's u. Pro prokaryotes, yes. So bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotes. Okay, however, they are very different. I mean, if you look at them under the microscope, they look similar, but it turns out, functionally, there are a lot of differences between bacteria and archaea. Algae. Different diatom algae. Okay. Now, algae are eukaryotes, so they have nucleus. They can be unicellular, like these diatoms, or they can be multicellular. If you go into the lake or into the ocean and swim there, you will see multicellular algae. So, okay, they can be unicellular or they can be multicellular, right? Now, protozoa, by the term protozoa, we describe the unicellular organisms that do not have cell wall, only cell membrane, uh, and do have nucleus, okay? So they are nucleated, they have always unicellular, and you can see the exemplary protozoan here, it's a Giardia lamblia, the causative agent of chronic diarrheal disease that is called giardiasis. Another name for this disease is beaver fever. Now fungi. Can fungi be multicellular? Come on. Yeah, you go into the store, you buy those mushrooms, it's, it's, it's the same, it's fungi. They belong to the same group. Mushrooms are just, just big parts of them, okay? So they can be multicellular, okay? Can they be unicellular? Sure enough. That's the yeast, Candida albicans, that causes candidiasis, um, the, the vaginal infection, or thrush the infection of upper respiratory tract. Okay, it's it's unicellular fungi. You can see the individual fungal cells in that picture. 
Okay, so, and they are, of course, nucleated. Helminths, that's my second love. I adore them. And you can see this to wonderful little guys. But here they, of course, they nucleated. Okay. And of course, they multicellular, always. But size wise, they can range from extremely small blood flukes or schistosomes that can be seen under the microscope, actually. They're really, really small. Or pinworms that which size can be about one millimeter to gigantic species like Tinea saginata, beef tapeworm, which in some cases can reach about 40 feet in length, or Dracunculus medinensis, um, or uh, guinea worm, that used to be a pretty common infection in Africa. Okay. And finally, my first love, Viruses. Viruses are technically, are not, you can see coronavirus and Ebola virus. So this coronaviruses, similar viruses cause SARS, um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, or MERS, Middle East respiratory syndrome. Ebola, well, doesn't need any additional introduction, I suppose. Viruses are a cellular. I don't want to say organisms. I mean, I do, but general consensus in biology says that viruses are not alive. What are the features of living things? When we call something living, what do living things do? What do they have? How do we know that something is living? Metabolism. So they have metabolism. Viruses don't have it. They don't have their own metabolic systems. They have to use energy provided by the cell. Okay. They don't have ribosomes. We're going to talk about it. They can't produce their own proteins. And they are, importantly, all life on Earth is cellular. And viruses aren't. So we do not consider them live. Does that make sense? So, NA, NA. Now, why this? So, fields of microbiology. Obviously, the, the field that studies bacteria is bacteriology. The field that studies algae is phycology. The field that studies protozoa is protozoology. Uh, yeasts, mycology. Uh, worms, helminthology. and viruses, virology. Before we move on, what you have to know, we're going to talk about structure a little more, but you absolutely must know whether a certain microbe has or does not have a nucleus, and whether the microbe is unicellular, multicellular, or like algae and fungi, technically can assume both. Am I clear? So if I ask you which of the following is multicellular organism, I give you bacteria, archaea, viruses, and helminths, you pick helminths. We good? We can move on. So bacterial cell, we're going to talk way more about bacterial cell and the structures. I just want to remind you 
what you can find in a typical bacterial cell. Every bacterial cell has, obviously, DNA, which is not in the nucleus. It exists in the form of nucleoid. Cytoplasm, that yellow stuff here, okay, which kind of fills up the cell, supports the structure. Ribosomes, those red dots inside of the cytoplasm responsible for protein synthesis. And cell membrane, the plasma membrane part of the cellular envelope. Every cell has it. There are no exceptions. Many bacterial cells have cell wall. Okay. Some have capsule, which provides, gives them some protection. Okay. Many cells have pilus. It's a structure that allows two cells to exchange genetic information. Some have flagella, which helps with movement. Um, many have inclusions that allow bacterial cells to store nutrients and some other practical, sometimes seemingly useless stuff. Fimbriae help bacterial cells to attach to the surfaces when they have to establish for instance, the infection, or they have to invade the tissue. And I think we went through every, everything. So we're going to talk about each part of the cell, but I want this picture to be in your mind right now so you, you can imagine what bacterial cell looks like and how it is different from other organisms. Okay. Now, protozoa and fungi are eukaryotic organisms. Protozoa are always unicellular. It's practically a rule. Okay, that's we call them protozoa. Um, they can be classified by four into four major categories according to the mode of movement. Some protozoa like amoeba, use so-called pseudopods, which is another word for false legs, to move around. So they extend pseudopodia, okay, attached to the surface and crawl through the surface. Does that make sense? This amoeba Another name for that group is sarcodina. Okay, crawling, amoeboid motion. Some use cilia, like Permisium, the protozoan that is that can be often seen uh, in the samples of water from the puddles and um, ponds and things like that. Okay. Promethium uses short projections, cilia, on its surface to move around in the water. And this, this group of organisms is called ciliophora, which is kind of logical. Mastigophora, flagellated protozoa. Well, surprise, they use flagellum. Okay, and they can be both benign, like euglena, or they can be very pathogenic. If you heard about the diseases like trichomoniasis, Chagas disease, African sleeping sickness, those diseases are caused by flagellated protozoa. And finally, apicomplexa. They call this way because of the so-called apical complex, apicoplast, one end, doesn't really matter for you now. But the point is that apicomplexa do not have any way to move. Okay, so they cannot lurk around in the environment searching for food. So their way of life is always parasitic.
they are obligate parasites. What obligate means? Anyone? What does obligate mean? When you're obliged to do something. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So when they obligate parasites, they must be parasites. They have no other way to live. And examples are numerous. If you've had, if you've heard about toxoplasma, toxoplasmosis, that's apicomplexin or protozoan. I bet you heard about malaria, apicomplexin protozoan. Okay, there are plenty of them that are parasitic. Any questions? So, if I ask you which of the following uses flagellum for movement, you can pick mastigophora. The four answers that I provide. Does that make sense? Good. Fungi. So what we're going to do? We're going to. Uh, sorry. Going to go through the. Um, couple more. You know, few more things. We're going to finish with viruses and we're going to take a break. How about that. And then we're going to do the lab. All right. Um. So fungi. There's so many of them, and they really, the big ones, the mushrooms, God, they taste it. I love them. Okay. So they can be classified based on the approach to reproduction. We're not going to dig too much into them, but we will try to talk about some pathogenic uh, fungi. There are plenty of them, not every, every fungus is pathogenic. Most of them actually aren't. I can give you, I can tell you even more than that. Vast majority of microbes cause, they, they, they cause no clinical disease in humans. They are not pathogenic to humans. Only few, we talk about few percent of microbes that are actually pathogenic to humans. Okay. So uh, we're going to look at the classification of fungi from the standpoint of the structure. Generally, fungi are divided into two groups. One group is called fungi, uh, sorry, molds. These are multicellular. You can see them like uh, the the bread mold. That's that's classic mold. They have like that velvety structure, velvety texture, or mold. God forbid, in the basement that grows on the walls. That's all mold. They can be these molds can be can have so-called septate hyphae, so many new words, I know. So when you look at the mold, and if you look really, really close, which I suggest you not, you don't do, okay? But if you do look close, you will see a lot of tiny projections, like hairs. Those hairs are called hyphae, right? So hyphae can be separated into the more or less individual cells, these are called septate, hyphae. Hyphae may not be separated, non-septate hyphae. Now unicellular fungi are called yeasts. You may ask, wait a minute, why on this picture you have yeasts growing as multicellular organisms? It is not just many cells together, but they do not communicate. Yeast, like like baker's yeast, they are unicellular organisms. You may have an entire cat of them, but one cell is enough to start replicating, to start growing the new organism, growing the new colony. That makes sense. Now, before we move on, and I will talk about what dimorphic is. Bacteria are always unis uh, unicellular, right? Algae can be multicellular. Fungi can be multicellular. Uh, animals, obviously, multicellular. Plants are multicellular. What, 
what bacterial and archaeal cells cannot do that, for instance, human cells can. Why humans can be multicellular and bacteria and archaea cannot? It's not an easy question. Mm -hmm. uh, if they come in contact with another bacteria, it's going to work against that just as well as it would work against like, the human, like okay. the host cells. Okay. You're on the right track. So when, when try to make an analogy with the sports. You have an individual sport, like tennis. person who plays tennis, does it talk? Unless she's Maria Sharapova, well, who yells, okay, they don't really talk. They all they out there by themselves. What about the team sports? Oh yeah. So they do what? How do we call that talking to each other? Communication, yes. So cells can cells eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells can communicate. Okay? effectively communicate and establish an effective way of communication between them. Bacterial cells cannot establish the same level of communication. Get it? We not they they do exchange some information. They exchange genetic information. They produce chemicals that they use to kind of communicate with each other but they cannot establish a good high throughput communication system between them why we don't really know but for some reason bacteria chose to be unicellular chose not to have the effect of communication team. okay so that's inability to communicate effectively is what makes them ultimately unicellular. Now going back to the fungi, what does it mean demorphic in idea based on what you've learned? You know we have fungi, we have molds, we have yeasts. Demorphic can be demorphic, both, yes. Great example is histoplasma capsulatum, the causative agent of Ohio Valley fever. Um, it grows in the environment as a mold, usually in the forests. When people go out in the forest and start to cut trees, they put the spores in the air, they aerosolize the spores, they inhale the spores. And when spores go into the human lung, which is much warmer than outside, they start to grow as yeast, not as mold. So it depends on the temperature. The fungus can be mold or yeast. That's why the fungus is called demorphic. Does that make sense? There's different species that can do that. Again, speaking of fungi, you have to understand the difference between yeast and mold and what demorphic is. Am I clear? Helminths. Lovely guys. There are um, two big groups, platyhelminths, which are flat. Okay, they further divided into the cestodes, which are tapeworms, and trematodes, which are flukes. So, for I just give you the you don't have to know like the the strategies for invasion of the life cycle not yet just know the classification so uh, tapeworms you've heard about like beef tapeworm and pork tapeworm and fish tapeworm they're pretty common um, invaders of the human intestines okay I restrict myself from talking more I love them really fascinating trematodes or flukes you who who have heard about the liver fluke? No? Well, good. I'm really happy. It means that uh, public health in the United States works well. 
If you go to Ireland, there's about a quarter of population that was infected or is infected with liver fluke because of sheeps. They transmit it. Sheeps are the sort of intermediate hosts. So people get it when they eat lamb or they just communicate with them, just, you know, herd them. Um, and nematodes. Nematodes or ashelmens are roundworms. Okay? That makes sense? Uh, great examples of those are pinworms. You should have heard about them. Practically, all kids have them. All kids. We all had them when, when we were kids. I guarantee that. If a person in the world gets infected, well, like the age of two, three, with pinworms. Um, Ascaris worms. If you would Google nematodes, probably images of Ascaris lumbricoides will pop up first, and they pretty gross. Right. And these guys, the nematodes, they contribute the most to diseases that are caused by the worms. Okay. So again, for worms, know the classification. So if I ask you which one of the following is the round worm, you have to say nematode. If, we, if I ask you which one is the flat, you have to say it's a cestode or trematode. Am I clear? Viruses. Um, acellular. Most of them are absolutely benign. The vast majority, actually. I think there are a couple of thousand that can cause human disease. Since they are cellular, we do not consider them alive. And since they are not, they don't have cell, they don't have metabolism, and they don't have ribosomes. So they have to be in the cell to replicate. That's why we call them obligate intracellular parasites. They must be inside of the cell. There are two major types of viruses. Naked viruses, and that's not a funny term, it's actually how they're called. Like this adenovirus, shown here on the right, consist of just two types of molecules. They have nucleic acid, that blue line, okay, as the, the genome, the genetic material, okay, and the protein that forms capsid, those uh, like grainy structure, the yellow grainy structure on the outside, you can see the capsid. So you have nucleic acid or the genome surrounded, covered by the capsid. These are naked viruses. Enveloped viruses, like this human immunodeficiency virus, consist of nucleic acid. Okay, you can see it here. Again, those the blue stuff. The capsid that's shown here. And capsid is made of protein and envelope. Envelopes on the outside of the virus, it consists of the proteins and phospholipids. Can anyone else tell me <coughs> which part of the cell? consists of phospholipids as well. The membrane, exactly. So viruses essentially, when they go out of the cell to infect a new one, they steal some phospholipids from the cell membrane. They, they grade, they save crackers, okay? They thieves, they steal stuff from the cell. Either they steal cellular organism and use them, or they they take over the entire cellular metabolism. They take parts of the cell to the advantage. Okay. 
in the cell, which molecule is the genome? The DNA, exactly, the DNA. Does it have two strands or one? Two, two double-stranded DNA, there are no exceptions. All cells have double-stranded DNA. It's the genome. Not viruses. They can have DNA as the genome, either single-strand or double-strand. And they have RNA as the genome, the same, single or double-stranded. Okay, that makes sense? It's pretty awesome. They, have, they can have all kinds of genomes. It's crazy. It was discovered in the end of um, 19th century by a Russian scientist, Dmitry Ivanovsky. He, um, he was studying the disease of tobacco. The disease was called tobacco mosaic. And what he did... He took a tobacco plant that was infected, crushed it, and then kind of in the water, made like a, I don't know, extract, okay? And then he filtered this extract through the filter that was supposed to contain all the bacteria. So far make sense? So if that disease would be caused by a bacteria, whatever goes through the filter should be sterile. Then whatever went through the filter, he took it and he sprayed it on uninfected tobacco mosaic, tobacco plants. And they got disease too. So it was something that was smaller than bacteria that could have been filtered. Initially, viruses were called filtrable, filtrable agents because they went through the special filters okay, that captured bacteria. They couldn't capture viruses. As I mentioned, it can be very, very small, like poliovirus, um, the size of about 30, 50 nanometers. Extremely large. The largest virus that we know so far is called Pandora virus. It has nothing to do with humans. It infects, actually it infects amoeba, it infects protozoa, okay? Um, and... It's so big, it's 700 nanometers in diameter. It can be seen in the light microscope. In fact, this is the reason why this virus was discovered only about 10 years ago. Because when people looked at the amoebae, they saw this giant thing inside of the cell and thought, holy crap, I don't know what it is, but it's definitely not a virus. Just too big to be a virus. Turns out, it turns out it was. And they, they're pretty fascinating. They, they, they bigger than the small bacteria, but they still cannot survive. Even the biggest viruses cannot survive without the host cell. Does that make sense? We discussed why they are not considered live, but you know because they don't have cell, they don't have their own metabolism, their own ribosomes. But let me throw something to your direction. Who does planting like? Plants, you know, stuff, put stuff in the soil so it grows up. No, nobody? Okay, good. Somebody does good. So, you buy seeds? Yes? Okay. They come in little pouches, right? Like, open the pouch, put the seeds on the table. What's going to happen to them? Nothing. Even if you wait for a year, right? Nothing. Are they alive? I mean, you can live like for 100 years, but I mean, are they alive? Are they gonna, like, if you buy 100 seeds in a year, are you gonna have 200 seeds? No, it's still gonna be 100. You put them in the soil, you get the plant. Is it alive? Oh, yeah, it's alive. So one of the concepts now that emerges in virology is that we just cannot talk about viruses as just particles that I that we described here, okay, like this or this. We have to consider virus being both outside of the cell. Outside of the cell, it's definitely not alive. 
But when it gets into the cell, it starts to replicate and changes cellular metabolism. So maybe we should think about the life form infected cell. Does that make sense? Like seed in the soil. That makes sense? This analogy is actually not really perfect. There are some very, very slow processes that go on in the seeds. But it serves its purpose, actually. Okay. So, we're going to talk about the importance of microbes later.